Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Well, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna get started now. Um, so first off, welcome everyone to the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. My name is Caroline Deemer, and I am the programming coordinator here at the museum. And I am so excited to welcome you to this month's Think and Drink. Um, Think and Drinks are a monthly free um, speaker series uh, that happens on the first Thursday evening of every month. This year, in celebration of the Cobia's 80th um, uh, anniversary for her Keel Lane and her launch. We are hosting a year of uh, free talks that are all about interesting and often um, untold stories from World War II. Um, so if you like this one, hopefully there's uh, check out our calendar. Hopefully you've got a couple other talks that might pique your interest. They're all really cool and interesting. Um, tonight we have a really exciting uh, talk for you. We've got this lovely panel um, here of some fantastic. Uh, a bunch of characters, uh, all both um, uh, submarine uh, cooks. Um, sadly, tonight we were also supposed to have Ma Mark Becker. If you've ever been to the museum, you've definitely seen Mark around. He's feeling a little bit under the weather tonight, but don't worry. Um, Jeff uh, Tess from Submariner's Bar and Tom Ramsey uh, are both excellent, and uh, they're going to give you uh, a really excellent talk. Um, you're also going to meet our fantastic community engagement coordinator, Lizzie Ferry, and she's going to give you a little bit of history about what it was like um, to be here eating food in Wisconsin during World War II. So that'll be lots of fun as well. Um, but before I let Lizzie and the boys take it away, I've got two things. Um, first off, I would like to thank our sponsor, the Wisconsin Humanities Council. Um, the Wisconsin Humanities Council is one of the reasons why these talks are able to be free. Um, the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Humanities strengthens our democracy through educational and cultural programs that build connections and understanding among people of all backgrounds and beliefs throughout the state. So we are so happy to have them be a sponsor. I'm so happy that these talks um, can be here for everyone to enjoy. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, our featured drink of the night. So I know that some of you guys, yes, some of you guys might be a little bit annoyed at me that we don't have any food, um, but I do have um, this lovely drink, the Suffering Bastard, which is actually a drink from World War II. Um, it was invented by the man that you see up here on the screen, um, Joe Sialamon. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that, um, who was a bartender at the Sheep Herds Hotel in Cairo, which was a really, really famous hotel. Um, and so it was a very, very popular place for Allied troops to hang out during the war. And um, they uh, ran into something that they weren't really expecting, which was really bad quality alcohol. <laughs> um, so they were drinking all of this low quality liquor and they were getting really, really nasty hangovers. Um, so they went to Joe and they said, Joe, you gotta help us out. You gotta figure out a good hangover cure for us. And so he went, you know what's the best way to cure your hangover? Just drink more. <laughs> so um, he decided to make this delightful hangover cure that combines brandy, gin, lime juice, and ginger beer, as well as some bitters, um, to help you know revive the guys and get them ready out um, to fight more battles. Um, it was so popular um, that during the Battle of El Alamán, um, Joe received a telegraph um, from the front that um, from the British front lines that was asking him to send as much of this hangover cure as possible to the front lines. So um, Joe gathered up all of the different containers that he could and he ended up sending about eight gallons. Um, and it seems to have worked. Um, that battle helped hold off Rommel's Nazis and um, prevent the Nazi invasion of North Africa. So um, while you guys get you guys get to drink a, a, a drink that defeated the Nazis, which I think is pretty fun. <laughs> so if you haven't if you haven't gotten a chance, our bar will be open afterwards as well to taste it because it tastes nice. Um, and I will uh, leave you guys with that, and I will uh, introduce Lizzie. Whoa. 
Thank you, Caroline. All right. So during World War II, there was obviously a lot of rationing going on of a lot of different products. One of these was a lot of different food products. Sugar and coffee were two of the first to get knocked out um, here in the States, mostly to save those supplies, conserve them so we can send them to these troops overseas, so we can use some of these factories and other things that are producing these products. We can um, basically redesignate them, re-put them towards the war efforts. That way we have everything going tw towards everything we need for this war effort. Everything was directed in that direction. So as you can see here, we have sugar, coffee, meats, fats, canned fish, cheese, canned milk, a lot of some of your kind of staples when you're coming, um, going to cook something or bake something. So this actually turned into um, the invention of some very weird workarounds and recipes during this time uh, here in Wisconsin during World War II. So they came up with some interesting alternatives to meat, since that was one of the top ration, rationed items during the war. Uh, so this little uh, pamphlet here was put out by the Department of Agriculture to kind of give people some creative ideas for different things that they could use in place of just regular meat. Uh, so to provide that protein, you could use peanut butter, eggs, soybeans, dried peas. Uh, so some examples would be that you could make a corn pudding from beaten eggs, cooked corn, milk, and seasonings. Um, so pretty, pretty normal. And then you get to, for a baked loaf, combine mashed cooked beans, milk, beaten eggs, breadcrumbs, and seasonings. Also, you know, pretty normal there. Then you get to blend peanut butter with tomatoes for soup. Um, and then you get to add peanut butter to your omelets as well. You know, give you a little extra protein in there. So they really kind of came up with some wild alternatives because they weren't able to get as much of these products. And this was happening all across the states uh, during that time. And, you know, people were generally usually pretty happy to do it because they understood that these things that they weren't able to get a hold of, they weren't able to get, were helping out the war effort. They were getting sent overseas to the troops across, um, fighting out there, and they were helping in this small way. Um, they were contributing to the United States' eventual victory in World War II. It also brought um, the rise of kind of convenience foods. You have a lot of women joining the workforce during that time. You send all the men overseas. You need um, the wives and mothers to come in, kind of take their place in the factories, that kind of thing. Um, so when, you know, you've got dad overseas, mom's in the factory all day, she comes home, you got to feed the family something. Uh, well, Kraft mac and cheese would come out. 13 cents a box, seven minutes to cook, and it's going to feed four to five people at a time. So that's kind of sort of the rise where um, these kind of convenience foods, things you could just heat up, make quickly, and would feed you and have all those different kind of components for a nutritious meal, or at least something that's going to fill your belly for a while. Here in Manitowoc, uh, production-wise, they were producing quite a few things. Uh, two of my favorite fun facts about the home front, particularly here in Manitowoc, is that we produce a lot of eggs and a lot of peas. To be precise, Manitowoc County chickens, all right? You got your chickens. They produce enough <coughs> eggs, bless you, during World War II that every citizen in the city of Manitowoc could have had 15 eggs per day if they really wanted to. So we, we had a lot of eggs going on. Uh, the other thing is peas. So we had lakeside can, uh, canning here in town, producing all sorts of different canned foods. Peas were a big crop here in town. There was actually 3,720 acres set aside here in the county just to grow peas. So eggs and peas, those were 
those were kind of our big staple crops um, here during World War II um, and produced a lot of a lot of different things, both to um, provide people with food here locally, as well as sending things overseas and all that good kind of stuff. So with that kind of brief overview of what it was kind of like here during uh, the war here in Wisconsin, we're going to look a little bit past the war. I promise both of these guys, I would not say that they were from World War II at any point during this presentation. <laughs> um, but we're going to kind of transition here and uh, get, some, get some cool, uh, interesting perspectives from these two gentlemen here. So an old friend of mine from World War II gave me the recipe they used, and it was really interesting. You would make your liver, slice it down, bread it, uh, dip it in milk overnight, and get rid of that crap. And then you fry it, put in onions, layer of onions, put it in with some beef base, and then cover it with all things. I almost died. Poultry seasoning. I said, well, hell, yeah, that sounds interesting. I tried it, and it weren't, I went from nine pieces to over nine pounds. So that recipe really worked. I, as silly as it sounded, it really worked. But cooking on a, on a submarine is always thrilling due to the fact that, for instance, birthing. In the cruise, uh, okay, when you go through the boat, you have the birthing area and so forth. And what people don't realize is they they put food underneath everything. They had canned foods in the number 10 cans, six to a case. And they two, again, and I was talking to a crew member and he was telling me, and they made it all the way through birthing. When you, in the cruise mess, and you walk over where the, uh, the, the uh, heater is where the where the mess cooks would wash the dishes and that you look down there is a hatch that goes down there and that was the chill box in the freezer so when you're at sea they converted the uh, chill box into a freezer so they could haul more food then they had straps and they had number 10 cans pan pan as far as i could see i guess but the thing about it is that it was uh, it was very interesting during the war that, that they had to keep the food going no matter how you look at it. And the thing about the cobia is the difference between a modern submarine today and the cobia. The cobia had the could dive for a small period of time, whereas idiots that were on a nuclear boat, crap, we know we were submerged. I mean, you know, months. You can ask my wife. I'd come in looking kind of weird, looking color. <laughs> okay. You were uh, and, you know, and uh, we talked funny. Uh, but I, I am I am serious. It was just uh, quite interesting on the boat. And the longest period I think I went was uh, three and a half. Uh, we ran out of food, if you can believe that. And the uh, submarine was supposed to replenish this it broke down so another sub was going to come out there and replenish it because in the meantime we were underneath the enterprise and keeping the russians at bay this was during the I iranian crisis and i was a captain running out of food so he said okay we did away with midrats that's the meal at midrats uh where it's not the middle of rats it's 
literally a ration that was normally leftover food. And then all of a sudden, no more eating what they wanted. They had to literally, oh, it was funny, tell the crew that, okay, no more, just going in there and get whatever you want. Really? Yeah. Because as the night baker, I wouldn't care if people would come in and cook and all that behind you. You don't care as long as you clean up your mess. And uh, but it was really funny because we kept running out of food. And finally, I did away with soups and I did all this. And I put in rations where they would got a portion. And, and that was running out of food. Finally, I told the old man, I said, we're running out of food. He said, the heck with it. And to tell you how bad it was, the last three days before we could surface, and load food is uh, I made a peanut butter. First, I made a paste of flour, cooking on the grill with three tablespoons of peanut butter because that's the ration of what would you call it, Kate? The uh, protein that you needed to stay alive. And this is what we ate three meals a day. So when we went into port, we had to be uh, load stores. And I always loved it because the uh, submarine crew is different than the rest of the crew. And we were up next to a tender, and the captain yells over, and says, did you get my ice cream? I said, no, captain, you're a diabetic. You can't have ice cream. <laughs> I want my ice cream. No. And uh, all of a sudden, because what he was doing was that the food was coming in, he was writing it off the list. I had three hatches open. Food was going down three hatches. The chief of the boat was running around giving everybody something to drink because it's kind of hot over there. And we had to be done out of there by uh, six in the morning because of the Russian satellite was coming aboard. So we, we broke our, I really worked really hard to do that. But it was really funny because all of a sudden I heard this voice says, XO, enlisted man talk to me like that i'd throw him in the brick and i turned around and said, oh don't worry about it ice cream's already aboard first thing i did well it doesn't matter you were talking disrespectful to him no i wasn't <laughs> he said you need a haircut said, we need a barber <laughs> you know there's no barber on board the sub and he goes well, well i can't talk and he ran away and i went oh god i told you the captain I said, hey, Captain, I said, you might get a, a warning from uh, from the ship over there that they had a cook that was disrespectful. I said, ah, hell with them. <laughs> but uh, that was when the, the only time that I ever heard of running out of food, literally. <laughs> but on the cobia, that was quite interesting, the same thing. They used to put the eggs as much as you could keep. You'd put them in the torpedo room forward underneath because that's the coldest spot on even the cobia today the oh. coldest spot on the sub awesome. yeah for Thank real you, yeah yeah and uh <laughs> the shower room made me laugh because that's where i put put the uh cases of onions and they said oh but the escape tank that was full of potatoes you'd say 20 pounds <laughs> down they'd come it's for real what we used to do is, being a cook on a sub, I got to wash up to here. Crew can only wash up to here. In other words, we we took sponge baths that best we could. On the cobia that drives me nuts, you can ask Karen this, drives me nuts. They had a water spigot. Just as you go through the cruise mess, there's a water spigot. I said, Karen, that's a crock. You didn't have a water spigot. Water was a commodity. You didn't waste it on drinking, for God's sakes. <laughs> oh, I said, uh, to this day, if you go through the cobia, you will see a spigot, which is, that's where the coffee pot used to be. Because the submarine sailor, what the right way to say it, we never ran out of coffee. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let Jeff here introduce himself. Jeff, if you want to <laughs> say who you are and why we invited you how you got to be a cook yeah <laughs> so i'm jeff tess um i served from uh i joined my junior in high school my dad right in front row signed up so i could leave um <laughs> and i served until um 92. um i was um 
force reduced in 92 by President uh, Bush. I agree with you. And uh, he saw I was asked to leave politely. Um, I did <laughs> 10 and a half years um, and all of it on subs. Um, I commissioned the 688 class submarine, the Augusta 710, and then went back and commissioned the 735 um, Trident. So my boats were a lot different than this. Um, 20 laps around the missile deck on a Trident yeah. is a mile, which is the same size as the gym at the YMCA. Um, we loaded stores on an elevator. We, um, when we were off crew, we'd get everything ready and an elevator would bring it down and we'd put it in place. And day one, you would rack day one. Um, on a 688, you did a stores load like they did. You brought them down. But um, the reason I wanted to talk is no matter whether it was the Cobia, the Augusta, the Pennsylvania, or Tom's boats, cooks were the most important person on the boat no matter what. I don't care if you think you were the captain or not. <laughs> we were Central Park. Yeah. Good. You play cards in my mess decks. You watch movies in my mess decks. You cried on, on someone's shoulder because your girlfriend broke up with you on an Instagram on my mess decks. Yeah, you sure. have, we did damage control on my mess decks. They've given me, my buddies in the Navy will give me crap to this day. I was a phone talker. I, my voice is not a phone talking voice. Shouldn't be on radio. So I was the guy, but um, the cooks controlled the boat. Yeah. Whether you're happy, you work eight hours, you sleep eight hours. We, they came to us where they were, were the only break. Um, I served during the Cold War, which is a little different than World War II, but um, we also were in very tense times. Um, I was in an incident in October of 88. You can read about it if you want to look. 17th, we might have hit something underway. Um, and during all that stress, it was the cooks who controlled what was going on. Chocolate chip cookies, I wrote when I was on TV last year when I opened my bar, um, chocolate chip cookies are gold. Yep. They're still gold. Sticky buns are gold. Tom and I shared one thing. We were both night bakers. Yeah. On my first boat, I started baking, and my captain came up to me and said, you are never doing anything but baking ever again. This is your job. Yeah. So I have, actually have a culinary degree in cake decorating and baking. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I baked one cake professionally. I dealt with one bride in my life. One. One. That was enough. But, um, and now I own Submariner's Pub. I see a lot of my regulars in here. Thank you for being regulars. Um, but Submariner's Pub is the same thing as the galley. It's a place to gather. It's a place to tell sea stories. It's a place to come and it's Central Park again. And that's our life. That's what we did for his 20 years, my 10 and a half. We served so people could serve. Yeah. Stop. Thank you, Jeff. Very good. All right. I've, I've got a question here to kind of start us off, and then we'll see if we have questions from the audience or our online audience as well. Uh, so I guess one of the first questions is like, what were your uniforms like? Obviously, we know you you didn't get to shower a lot, so you probably didn't get to also uh, wash your clothes a lot. So what what did you wear while you were cooking aboard your submarine? You can go ahead first, okay. Jeff. So we'll my up. boat was different than his. I'm younger than he is by a lot. So <laughs> um, 688s, we could shower. Cook showered all the time. We had our own berthing. So 688 is a Los Angeles class fast deck submarine, the boat in Hunt for in October. Yep. Side note, they filmed Hunt for in October on my boat. I have pictures of Alec Baldwin and us hanging out. Um, but so we had it very nice. We could shower, um, but we were still limited to the same thing. We, our food was 30, 90 days and then we were back. So um, what was the question? What did you wear? What did you wear? We had a really cool captain. I wore the same thing I'm wearing right now. But I wore cowboy boots and pink tennis shoes. Yeah. There is a pink Converse tennis shoe in my book on my in my bar. And it's I wore pink tennis shoes and I'm still known to every veteran that I know as the pink tennis shoe guy. Because I it was supposed to be comedy. I was the relief. So I would be cooking in shorts, a t shirt that said something inappropriate. Yes. And and pink tennis shoes. Sometimes in underwear. Yeah. Perfect. How about you, Tom? 
Okay. I don't know if you guys ever hear, but they had what they called goofy suits. They had one piece suits that they would wear. Now I cut mine off and I just wore a t-shirt that maybe Polish power, black power, whatever. So he's right. We, we, whatever, that's what it was. And, uh, 688 class isn't interesting because the Omaha was the second one. The Los Angeles was the first one. And it stayed next to the pier. It never went out. I think it was scared of water, but not sure. <laughs> but it, it did sat there. But uh, it was fun. We wore, a, I, we wore a poopy suit. So when I went to shore duty, I asked him, I said, I need time off to get some clothing. And this chief said, well, we should do a sea bag inspection. I said, really? First, you got to give me a sea bag. <laughs> you know, the first thing you lose on a, on a submarine, get rid of that stuff. And he goes, oh, well, and the commanding officer said, let him go to the exchange, which he did. The next day, I got off for a couple of days where I could get uniforms. Other than that, we just <laughs> were very comfortable. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. I would not wear shorts in the galley. I... Uh, no way, in way with the deep fat fryer and I loved each other. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, I did not wear shorts. Now, on his beloved Cobia, they show him bringing that one gentleman that got shot out of the water. You will notice them. They were in shorts. And they that's what they wore down the board. I asked the crew member, he said, I said, did you really wear shorts? And he goes, oh, yeah, because it's hot. It's terribly hot, too. We can't wash them. So we'd get topside. The did. captain would have a call, and we'd all go take a dip, come back up, lay on topside, close our clothing, and away we'd go again. And basically nothing really changed, did it? Nope. No. <laughs> no. But I, that's why I don't, I still let it this day, I will, will not wear shorts in the galley. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So did we have any questions from our other in-person or online audience at all? Yes. If you were a bakery chef, why did you have to worry about the deep fryer? All right. So yes, if you were a bakery chef, the night baker, why did you have to worry about the deep fryer? Because I'd have to do the breakfast then at nighttime we do, do mid rats, so it would uh, get to keep on cooking. It's so really the rest of the crew is is on eight. Uh, what was it? You had what six off or eight no off? Eight. eight off. Okay. But we didn't. We were on a cook is on twenty four hours, twelve right. off, twelve on. So the night baker okay. comes in at seven thirty. He yeah. cleans up dinner, um, makes mid rats. Mid rat. There's four meals every eight hours we feed, yes. okay. and we feed constantly. There's all something going on. So what, you're cleaning up dinner, you're baking, you're mm -hmm. making mid rats, and then you're prepping breakfast. Uh -huh. So then the breakfast cook comes in. Mm -hmm. So, and donuts are deep fat fried. Oh yeah. Well, that's true. Okay. Um, deep that's fat fry. Yeah. Donuts. You can deep fat fry anything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the part that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting part is that when you said donut, yeah. let me tell you. I, I always wondered because I'd have to make 500 donuts. Oh my God. I'm not joking for a crew of, you know, 90 guys. How many are you guys eating? Right. You know, oh my God. And he's not, I, I'm not lying, am I? No. Boy, oh, okay. donuts disappear. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Oh, we got another one back there. Okay. Actually, this is a question for you. Um, what is. Or Lizzie, um, okay. what's the difference between um, the fats being rationed and the meats being rationed? Yeah, so what they actually did, the question was, what is the difference between the fats that were rationed during World War II and the meats being yeah. rationed? Yes, so were. the fats, you could actually use basically for the nitroglycerin to make bombs. So you'd save, like, if you made bacon, you happened to get bacon from somewhere and it wasn't rationed at that point, you could save your bacon grease and yeah. donate that because then they'd use that to help make the bombs and everything. So it was like a completely kind of separate thing. You were also saving, like, your lard and all that good kind of stuff that you were also baking with as well. So fun fact on that is A1 was designed 
1942 <laughs> to cover up rancid meat because you had to eat all your meat. So yeah. A1 and all that was designed to cover up the because you you didn't want to throw anything away. Yeah. So A1 and all that was designed. So when you throw it on your steak and I get mad, it's not because I don't like you. It's because it, my meat's not rancid. Yeah. <laughs> He's correct. Yes. I have a little interesting information about a ration. Um, there were two colors to the ration stamps, the blue and red. And the red in particular was used for fats. Um, my late husband was part of a, well, now a fifth generation of uh, cheese and dairy. And um, his father had to accept ration stamps to sell cheese or dairy product. One ration stamp was worth 10 points. And if you perhaps bought something that cost eight points, there had to be a way to give you change without giving you money. And so um, I forgot the name of the department that produced it, but they had tokens worth one point. And so you would get these little, they were like cardboard, but I don't think cardboard was made back then, but um, it would have a one on them. So for every 10 points, a ration stamp was worth 10 of these tokens, and you would get that as change. Awesome. Uh, yeah. This is a shameless plug. When you come to Sub Mariner's Pub, you will see a one cent ration coin top shelf of the um somebody gave me one. So I have a one cent ration coin, which is from World War II where they got it. So it's a it's a little coin that says one one cent ration. The reason I know this is because I have been uh, cleaning. <laughs> you have more? Wow. Yo, wow. I have a home. <laughs> wow. She's worth a lot. Wow. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions way in the back there? Yes. Yeah. So I was wondering um, for, for both of you guys, what was your favorite thing to cook? All right. What was your favorite thing to cook? Lasagna. Lasagna. Great. Any particular reason why? It's fun. Okay, fair, fair. How about you? Chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, you go. Because it got me things. Yeah. You could trade chalk, You could trade chocolate chip cookies to the watch up on the up on the sale when we're on the surface of a submarine, and then I could smoke my cigar and drink my underway wine. Yeah. And he would sit in my because you had to have a fire watch in a galley, so you would give him cookies, and he would go down in your galley, and you'd get to go out in the moonlight in the middle of the ocean and smoke a cigar and breathe a little fresh air. And it got you liberty. It got you a lot of things. Chuck chip cookies were good. Still are good. I still don't like that fresh air stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with surface and they'd open the hatch and I'd tell my wife all the time, says, God, it stinks. She goes, well, you don't smell so good either. <laughs> all right, we got another question there. How about a diesel boat back in oh. the 70s? And half the crew stayed in, the other half went out to sea with 38 dependents. That's wives and friends and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. We did seven dives with all these people on board. Yeah. And lasagna was the, the, the lunch dinner. They ran out of lasagna. For, so the last group to be fed, it was the downfall was steaks. Immediately, the cooks brought out the steaks, and the last group got steaks. Wow. Well, that's true. There you, there you go. A solid fact, and even in World War II, today's submarine gets six dollars and thirty-two cents per sailor. Today's surface craft gets three dollars and five cents per sailor to feed. So I have one hundred and thirty-three at six dollars. They have five thousand and three dollars. I win every time. <laughs> every the, time. And the thing that I always liked per day. The thing that I always liked was submariners, they got soft toilet paper. <laughs> Not like the skimmers. It had soft, I swear it stuff in there. But we got soft toilet paper. There you go. There you go. Another question there in the very back. Yeah, I was an army cook. So um, 
Uh, we're you. sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, it was. So the AFRS was designed in 1967 to unify all the military. So your AFR, American Forces Recipe Card Service, were the same. Um, were the same. All the military same were the same. They just put different names on it, and I did some research on it before this today. In 19, uh, 1858, the Army was the first one to unify, unify recipes. So in 1858, the Army put it together, and then in the 1960s, the military joined, and it took the recipes from all the services and combined it. And there's literally only been 15 changes since the beginning. If Banana you, salad. If you, if you look at a recipe card, and same thing with the Army, our cards did for 100. There's also a card that does 500, and they have a card for 1,000. So that was the only difference. All the time. <laughs> you can come to Submariner's Pub on every third Sunday and you can get shit on a shingle. <laughs> <laughs> and and I still love it. I also like Spanish. So the difference between a submarine cook, by the way, and a surface cook, I fed 133 people. A number 10 can, which is the big can with yes. corn, feeds 25. So for 133, I'd open six cans of corn. My dad was on New Yorktown. That's 5,000 people. That poor son of a bitch opened 400 cans of corn. Yeah. <laughs> and there was one cook who just did corn on a carrier. What's your job today? Test corn. <laughs> yeah, it was fun cooking on them. Yes. On the new boat that I was on in Holy Lock, Scotland. Yeah. We, we, would, we would load stores. Yep. And it was third class or less would go topside to help load stores. Wow. We always sent all of our third class in the engineering spaces up there because we would steal and capture yeah, stuff did. that was supposedly for the entire crew. <laughs> all the sticky, uh, uh, all the uh, almonds and uh, pecans and all that stuff. The mixed nuts. Us, us mixed nuts. nukes would steal, yeah. take down to the engine room and hide it above maneuvering. And the cooks would come back in uh, during the patrol <laughs> Just please, some, give us some nuts. For yeah. <laughs> no, he, he's correct. Yeah, but you needed my underway wine underway. Uh, yes. So I got my nuts back. <laughs> All the time. All right. We got another question and over there. Fun, by the way. How does one become a cook on the sub? There we go. How does one become a cook on a submarine? You have to be crazy, number one. Let's start. <laughs> My parents weren't married. That had something to do with it. I'm not sure, but I think that could have had something to do with it. So the truth is, every cook is the same, whether it's Tom or me or if all my buddies are cooks. We have this call to serve. And we want to serve because the truth is, when you feed somebody a good meal, whether it's today or tomorrow, the next day in 1965, I make you smile. So we we grow from that. When you come to my bar and I feed you and you say it's great, it's the same thing. I started in 1979 in McDonald's and McDonald's in 1979 in McDonald's in Manitowoc was two arches and a and a silver, there were no seats. Then they closed that, they shut those doors. I fell in love with pleasing people. Yeah. I fell in love with instant gratification of making something that made you smile. Yeah. And I'm still that way today. I'm driven that way today. So is Tom. So is every cook you know. We want to make your day better by the food we produce. Yeah. Period. He's not lying. Nope. 100%. So you didn't really have any cooking or baking or any kind of experience before you <laughs> um, My mom sucked at cooking. There you go. So <laughs> cooking. There you go. So my dad's right there. My dad cooked. So my my dad taught my mom to cook. And and we learned survival. to cook. We learned to cook. And and the Navy sends you to this really cool thing when I was in. This is my book from culinary school. 
So you get a, a basic culinary school, you learn how to not burn water. Then you go to the boat and you learn how to cook. Um, so I learned more when I was underway than I did when I was in school, but I learned the basics. But I love to cook. Like even at McDonald's, I love to cook. I love to be in the kitchen. So, and that, I think that's what drives every cook that I know is that we just love to cook. What? Yeah. Yeah. How you started. Oh, I had no choice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, like I said, my mother was terrible, but I couldn't talk when I was young. Uh, and uh, now people say you talk too much, but, <laughs> but, uh, of the kids, the good kids, they always like to get to the cripples and that and beat the shit out of this, you know. So I was, as usual, in a fight, and they pulled me off, and this cook was standing there. It was the first man I ever met that had a hair lip, and he talked with a lift. And he said, then you talk. And I go, no. <laughs> so I went down, and I started cooking when I was in third grade. Yes, and I went to different schools, uh, uh, restaurants, mm -hmm. and then I went to chef school in Chicago, and I was working at Playboy Club when I got uh, drafted in the Army because Playboy Club was the greatest spot that God put on the earth. <laughs> we were up high and they had to speak, and we had to look down. God, it was the greatest job but uh, no, that's how I started to cook, and uh, it was really funny. I walked into this rest, uh, uh, in in Chicago. I walked into this uh, store, and I said, uh, "I gotta make lasagna." And they said, "Well, you haven't made lasagna." And I said, "No." So this woman invited me, a, a, a girl, and she was really funny because. Everything cut the buck of two fifty. You know, where, where she comes from, Italy, everything was a buck of two fifty. And she taught me how. She says, if you're gonna make lasagna, first you had to learn to do how to do the noodles. So I spent three days making noodles. And then you had to learn how to make the sauce and how to take the tomatoes and to peel them. You guys ever peeled a tomato? I looked at the guy and said, What are you on drugs? <laughs> so I, I never seen it, but Peeler for a tomato. Right. You know, you, you cut them around, dip them in boiling water, boop, yeah, yeah. And so it was kind of interesting. That's how I started cooking like that. Plus, I, I'm not lying. My mother could not cook. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not lying. You can ask my wife. To this day, my mother can't cook. God, it's horrible. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Do we have? <laughs> yeah. Do you have any other questions so far? Yes. Did it get rough under the water or no? Where, Did it? Pots and pans oh, Did it yeah. get rough under the water? Yes. A cook's worst nightmare is angles and dangles on a boat. Yeah, exactly right. Whether it's that thing there or ours. No. In today's new subs, their ovens are beveled, so they roll with the freaking things. Really? Pussies. Boy, that's the one I mean, wimps. Yeah. <laughs> but no, yes, terrible. Absolutely terrible. Once you're underneath the water, even with this at 100 feet, it's oh, it's bliss. Cool. It's just until they're doing drills. and. But yes, we, we had an egg hanger, and that's a machinist mate who handled the diesel design us wedges so when we did angles and dangles we could shove wedges in because your cakes your pies whatever would end up in your oven and then it would be hours of cleaning <coughs> an oven and and i can i say one question with that it, it it's true because they forgot to call me that they were going to go up and do angles and dangles and of course they did and i walked up to control them this is not a joke with the pie and i threw it right to the damn floor and I told the captain, that's your dessert. And I walked away. And he turned to the mess, uh, to the other the helmsman and goes, did you call up the galley? Did you even tell him you were going to do this? No. This gentleman, who was an officer, 
I had to go down and do all my pots and pans for the night. <laughs> because they should have told me they were going to do this. I wouldn't have put them into the oven. Honest. And, and once again, you're dealing with a 90-day supply. And, yeah. and that gave us more power than we deserve. Because when you ruin my pie, I can't make another one without cutting in to the future. So so that that became important because submarines don't always get to go home in 90 days nope. to refurnish. No way in there. I spent 286 days away from the United States once. And I want to tell you something. You eat whatever you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you guys describe for the audience here what you did with your trash, your, your garbage? Oh yeah. So what did you do with your trash? That was, that is interesting. We kept it and we brought it back to port, port. and we were ecologically sound. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. Excuse me. Hey, yeah, yeah. He he he. Correct. Right. You're on drugs, dude. <laughs> but seriously, when it came to the trash, the, okay, 1943 to 1966, I was into my first piece of oil in 1966. Nothing changed except the names of the uh, products, where they came from. Other than that, you kept your cardboard until you would get into a port and get rid of the cardboard. Other than that, <laughs> it, they had garbage cans made for us, and you had to roll them, put on the bottoms. They even had on a boomer, they had you had to put weights in, and we'd shoot them out of the bottom of the ship. And and we did that sort of. There there are five holes that shoot out into the sea on a submarine: four torpedo tubes and a TDU. Trash, trash disposal unit. Trash disposal. So you unit. load all your wet trash first, which is bags of disposable garbage in a biodegradable bag. And even in 1983, it was a biodegradable bag. And you put that in, you throw a 10 pound weight in it, and you'd shoot it out, and it would sink to the bottom. Then all of your metal, you would put in an aluminum roll can. You'd have to build it, and you'd put all that in, yes. and then you'd shoot that to the thing. So it was, and again, on a submarine, a hole to the water, to the world, is not a good thing. Nope. So it was a painstaking pain in the thing. But, yes. But, yes. Um, because you, they always shut trash late at night. So you, and if you weren't on watch, you got woken up to shoot trash. So you'd be PO'd and you'd have to go get rid of all the garbage. And they didn't shoot trash every week. They shut trash every once in a while. So it would be an hours and hours and hours thing and you would get rid of it. And on his old boat, the TDU was in the galley, so it was terrible. On my boat, the TDU was a separate room, so it was trash disposal unit, by the way. Um, it was a little better and cleaner and didn't smell as bad. Yeah. <laughs> on, uh, you pile it in the TDU till you, can't, <laughs> till you can't store it anymore. Yeah. So you'd end up with piles of rotting garbage. Yeah, that car also, that was kind of interesting. Is I always loved. I always loved this one nook we had. He was a skinny little man, and I loved having him because we'd put down the flour cans and the sugar cans down the frame base. And they'd slide in. Now, being a skinny little guy, we'd put a rope around his ankles and send him down. And he'd pull up the cans. <laughs> this, this is for real. This is for real. <laughs> it? A modern submarine has two hulls, yeah. and in between the two hulls is framework where you could stick things you shouldn't and yeah. garbage you could. Yeah. There you go. Yes. yes. You're on patrol on a nuclear boat. Yeah. And if you we're underwater for two months. And yeah. And within a week and a half, the garbage disposal unit broke. Yeah. It's, it's like a torpedo tube that these guys are describing to dump the stuff out of. Yep. It broke. We're continuing for the patrol. For you got the that rest right. Of the time. All the garbage went into an auxiliary tank. Yes. We opened the manway. We put everything in there for a month and a half. The ungodly situation was it came back in the Holy Lock, Scotland. We opened that thing up, and we had to get everything out of there. Third class and below. You got that right. Oh, yeah. yes. it, was, it was a all hands. It was all hands. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah, yes. you, you, you just can't believe what you do with the trash. I mean... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> kind of a kind of a similar question. Um, pests in vermin. Did you guys have to deal with uh, anything like that on the boats? Yeah. Uh, only one time in Seattle. Uh, what we did was uh, in Seattle, we had a, a watch that made sure that none of these little critters came aboard and uh, the rats came aboard and they had rat guards. And of course, they said, well, where's your rat guards? And we looked at them like, well, are you guys smoking dope or something? We don't carry shit like that. So they had to go into a skimmer and borrow his rat guards that went around the it, uh, a rat guard is a metal round thing, looks like a dog, like you when your dog licks himself too much, you put it on his head, you put yeah. it on the thing, and then the rat can't crawl so long. And the rat can't go across. And if they try, they get the bleach. But I uh, I won't lie to you, I, I wouldn't go in my tank storeroom for about two months because I'd send my mess cooks. I didn't know if the rats were there or not. <laughs> I don't like rats. <laughs> I never had to deal with it, so I'm good. Yeah. There we go. Always a good thing. Always, Always a good. good. Thing. Do we have any other questions? Do you guys ever have to go on water hours? Oh, hell yeah. On the bigger boats? So everyone else put the cooks did yeah. on my boats. We could Hollywood. Hollywood is a show where you turn the water on and you wash, just like you do at home. Everyone else had to wet, soap, turn the water off, soap. Turn the water back on, rinse off, and they could only use 1.2 gallons per shower. No. And they had a regulator on it. Cooks on my boats didn't have that issue. We could Hollywood. So we we on the boats I was on. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they would let us uh, on the like you were saying the boat was open. We could take a shower, but it was. Turn the water on, turn it off, soap down, turn it on, rinse, and step out. That was it. So, you know, that, that so was just Hollywood. for the crowd, when I was a little kid, my dad is an aircraft carrier guy. Ooh. That's how I was taught to shower. Yeah. This, I, and I'm 58 years old, and that's how I was taught to shower by my dad. That's how they showered. Turn the water on, get wet, soap, turn the water off. He grew up in a different time than I did, yeah. no different than submarines have grown from now. The new submarines coming out, the Columbia class, which the USS Wisconsin is the second Columbia class, are 583 feet tall, long. That's two football fields, ladies and gentlemen, 44 feet wide and 10 stories tall. Wow. That's something that's designed to sink. <laughs> yeah. My fast attack was the same size as his Yorktown carrier. Same square footage. These wow. tridents are ridiculous. I mean, they're just they're the most beautiful thing in the world. And the USS Wisconsin is slated for keel laying next year, um, commissioning in 2000 and 2030. And if you if you want to travel to Groton, it's worth the time. Yeah. It, my dad has been to a couple commissionings with me. It's an amazing event. Awesome. Groton, Connecticut. Groton? Yep. Yes. It's being built by Electric Boat in Groton. Yeah. Groton, Groton. Same place that built Golia. We got yes. another question over there. To no fault of your own, was there ever cases of food poisoning or lots of people that you Was there ever food poisoning? One time, my wife and I were on a, another island. They called me up and they said they had food poisoning, so they busted me over the phone. So when we got back to port, they found, no, it was because the dishwasher broke down and it wasn't rinsing. So I got to keep my stripe. But it was pretty bad to be in another, over another island and get busted, but what the hell. And in my case, never. Never. I've never seen food poisoning on a submarine. Never. Cooks on submarines, because it's a controlled environment, are probably the most precise people you'll ever meet. Yes. I'm less precise now than I was back then, but I want to tell you, if it said do it, you did it. Because you, again, if you screwed up, it costs a lot. Yeah. And, and if you look over at this, what I have here, you will see some of the Navy cooks, what they have done for decorating and so forth. It's kind of interesting to see it. Now, on a recipe card, this is one. 
And what you do is to a new mess cook, brand new cook, you're not sure that he knows the commodity. So you make him cook on a recipe card until he got used to the amount. And then I'd say, okay, what are you gonna change different? They would tell me, I'd say, fine. And after that, be your own. And cooks on a submarine were quite good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a, a yeah. comment. The, the, they, these guys are humble. We ate the best yeah. of the entire fleet. Nobody eats better than a submarine crew. <coughs> Not only uh, one of the perks of being on a submarine is that we don't necessarily go by the book, obviously. <laughs> and the cook's the same way. Well, yeah, you've got a, a an official GI recipe, but you, but they take a sample and say, "How is that?" Well, it needs a little of this, or it needs a little of that, and they doctor it up so that it came out really good. I my mother was unlike you guys, <laughs> unlike us. Unlike, yeah, you had a mother that could cook. Wow, that's different. I never ate as good in all my born days. As I did on a submarine. But and they will never now, admit that. We'll, we'll go to a, a fancy fine dining establishment and I'll look on the plate and, well, it's not bad, but it's not as good as I had before. <laughs> <laughs> and they will never admit that to you either. <laughs> So I, I'm so sorry to, to cut this off. I think you guys could talk for, I mean, I think I could listen to them talk for forever. Oh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, if you guys afterwards want to come up and look at some of the recipe cards, if you have questions, the bar is going to still be open for a bit so you can still chat. But um, I'd like to have everyone join me in thanking Jeff and Lizzie and Tom. <laughs> like to thank everyone else here at the museum who helped us put this on. Um, so for our ba bartenders, um, for Cam and Greg who have been hanging out over here making sure that everything's online, um, for Hannah, our collections person, making sure we can have some of these cool collections out so everyone can see. I just also want to give them a thanks as well. Because <laughs> and I, I want to thank you guys once again for coming out um, and being part of the Thinking Drinks. If you enjoyed this talk and want to see more like it, please consider supporting the museum. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can support the museum. You can donate, you can become a member, or especially if you really like hanging out on submarines and uh, talking a lot about them, you could become a volunteer and help us talk to, um, to other people about why submarines are really cool um, and spreading, you know, spreading that love around. Um, so if you guys are interested in any of that, we've got information up on our front desk. Um, we also um, have, uh, tonight we've got uh, a book about cooking in submarines. It's from a different perspective, but uh, from another cook on a sub, we've got a book that's in our gift shop there. So if you guys are interested, there is a book that you can read as well. Um, so lots of interesting things there. And uh, next month um, on, uh, oh, is it May? It's May 4th um, at 6.30, so same time as this. Um, we are going to be having a really interesting talk. It is called... Uh, 125,284, um, which is all about Japanese internment, racism, and Americanism um, with speaker Joy Block from UW-Madison. So that's going to be a really interesting talk. So um, if you guys are interested, uh, please come on out again. We'd be so happy to see yeah. you. And thank you so much. And if you ever want to volunteer, to help do what we do, keeping this boat. I've been working on this thing since, what, 83. And uh, at any time you want to work on it, let us know. We have working parties. We have people come up from Chicago, come around, and we're, we're, like we're doing the deck and the flooring and so forth. And so if you ever want to want to work on it, you can come down and work on this sub with us. We'd be happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you.